My relationship with horses started before I was born. Mum rode heavily pregnant mustering on the farm. So you can say I've pretty much been born into um, a horse relationship. And as you can see, family were heavily involved. My dad was a round-the-ring jumper. Uh, Mum was a very keen hunter and um, has been known as a small kid to climb up trees and jump off them, trying to find, hoping there's going to be a horse underneath. So um, we've, I really was very, very lucky to be born into that family. Uh, when I really got involved in my riding in my teens, um, eventing was in its heyday in New Zealand. We had Blythe winning the... Um, the World Championship. We obviously had Toddy winning a couple of Olympics. So eventing was enormous in the 80s. And I was very lucky to be around and eventing quite seriously at that time. We had access to some phenomenal coaches. Um, Blythe was the coach of our um, Pony Club Champs team. And um, I've trained with Captain Mark Phillips and Jack Legoff, who is the trainer of the US Olympic team. So it was an amazing time to be riding quite seriously because we had so many good people coming over here. Um, and it was a, a really fun time. For me, horses were really exciting. Um, I was very brave, and I had absolutely no problem getting on anything and jumping over anything. And um, then I grew up. Oh, bugger. <laughs> and um, the handsome bay guy there, um, he took it upon himself to um, put my ego down to size. I came back from a stint in England working and thought, I'm an experienced rider, I'll buy a young thoroughbred and turn him into an eventer. Well, a black eye later and a very badly split lip and a quite worried husband um, a couple of months before our wedding day saying, I just don't think you should ride that horse anymore. Him. The photos weren't going to look nice with all the facial in injuries that I was starting to incur on him. And um, as I said, his role was to say, you think you can ride, but you don't know squat. So he was an interesting little guy. The guy down the bottom there, um, Cracker, again, he's a fairly recent horse that I've had dealings with. And I would say he's probably, of most, he's my um, emotional coach. You can train a horse's body physically, but if you don't sort out the emotional side of it and the connection side of it, you really haven't got a horse. Um, he came to me as just a, a, a lease horse. Uh, I liked the look of him, a friend offered him, and I started to ride him. Uh, when he wouldn't really want to go forward, I found this quite frustrating, and um, took out my usual you know, tricks of the trade, a whip and some spurs, and he ceased to go forward even more. And then I started looking into his history a little bit, and I found out that he'd, um, he'd actually killed another stallion, and that was the reason, reason he was gelded, and that at six weeks old, he was orphaned. And he really led me to the area of animal communication, because I just couldn't work out how to make this little guy happy. And when I started learning how to connect with animals, um, he was pretty much one of the first I stood in front of him and I just quietened my energy down and I connected with him and I felt like someone had punched me in the heart. It turns out that he was laboring under a massive burden of grief. And as I went into it and learned more about the communication, um, he basically said, my life is being destroyed, blown apart, what's the point? Um, so he was a really, again, interesting teacher. But the main teacher is the beautiful grey mare. And as you can see by the photo at the bottom, um, when we attempted dressage, she was quite a strict taskmaster. This was a look on her face that I've seen rather often and a, a feel on her back that I felt rather often. And she would not put up with anything but the best. And from that, um, I'm very, very grateful. I was also really quite embarrassed on multiple occasions. But um, she was fast and furious, absolutely beautiful, big, active thoroughbred mare. And after a couple of children and 20-something years, my pelvis wasn't what it used to be. What used to be effortless as a child, I couldn't do anymore. I wasn't as stable in the saddle, and she hated it. So thank you very much for being so difficult, Dewey, because you really inspired me to learn a hell of a lot in the time that you did that. Um, so yeah, my mind and my body had changed. I wasn't as brave as I used to be. And I certainly had enough of my internal voice saying, you should be able to do this. This is ridiculous. This horse wouldn't worry you when you were a kid. Yet really helpful, not. So I threw the kitchen sink of learning at these horses. And as you can see by the words up there, 
Um, no stone was unturned. Body, mind, and spirit. I started doing Pilates twice a week. I got in a biomechanics expert instructor from, the, um, from Australia to try and tell me what I should do with my body because for some reason when I was a kid I didn't have to try and talk to my body but now as an adult the lines of communication have been completely blown apart. Could be a couple of natural births adding to that. I went into the, as I said, the animal communication side. I studied zoology, anthropology. Well, you can read for yourself. The list goes on and on. And it really was a fantastic learning experience, but it was also incredibly frustrating. And my ego got a severe kicking because I actually thought I could ride. Hey, I've got ribbons and, you know, I've been to the three-day event champs and there's all the evidence. But as an adult, it just didn't work anymore. And it was very frustrating. So I just want to say up front that I have no hidden agenda. I've given most things with horses a bit of a bash. I'm not here to tell you how to feed. I'm not here to tell you how to work your horse. I'm not here to tell you whether to cover it or uncover it, what bits to use or anything like that. That's completely up to you. It's your horse. It's your choice. But what I am here to do is enhance your mutual joy. I want both of you and your horse to be having an absolutely fantastic time. So every time you go out to the paddock, you're thinking, this is going to be great. And your horse is saying, yippee, my rider's here. That's what my agenda is. OK. Now, we're going to quickly turn to our worksheets that you've got in front of you. And you haven't got a pen. Again, there's some up the front. And I would invite you to answer the first question about connection what it is for you to connect with your horse and how much horses mean to you in your life. You can tick as many or as few as you like, whatever grabs you. Okay. I'd also like you to identify three moments of joy with horses. Completely open slather. Ridden, unridden, looking at them in the paddock, whatever. It's completely up to you. Okay, it looks like most people have been able to find three moments of joy pretty quickly. In those moments of joy, can you just have a quick scan through them and say, were you alone or were you with other people? Humans, humans. <laughs> people, humans, yeah. <laughs> Human people as opposed to horse people. <laughs> And the second thing around your moments of joy, have you identified an achievement or have you identified a feeling? There's no right or wrong here, guys. You don't have to hand your exam papers in at the end and get graded. It's just to bring awareness. So. And no one need ever see them. You can hide them. <laughs> OK, so moving on to the next question there. When you ride, you usually feel, and if you could just pick three things that top of mind things, they don't have to be well considered logical answers, just top of mind things. And the more honest, the better. Okay. So now your next question is what would you like to feel? In an ideal world, what would riding mean to you? What would, when you went to ride, if you could guarantee three feelings, what would be at the top of your list? Okay, it's really nice to see that a lot of the words up there are to do with the partnership, the togetherness, how well you're working in harmony as two beings but with a shared purpose. So it, there's some really, really lovely words up there. Accomplished, that's an interesting one. Is that an internal goal or an external goal? I'm not going to ask you to answer it because that would make you uncomfortable. But all I ask you is just to think about it, is that how do you feel accomplished? How would you feel differently in your body if you were to feel accomplished? So, yeah. Thank you very much, guys, for um, being so generous with sharing your thoughts there. This world, which is an absolutely amazing place. So what is a horse? Well, a horse is sentient. And sentient means the ability to feel and to perceive. 
And we know they're sentient because in 1997 there was a law passed to say that horses and other mammals are sentient, which kind of sounds ridiculous that anyone would ever doubt that they weren't. But, um, yep, the 1997 Treaty of um, Amsterdam actually codified that horses were sentient. They're also very physically and emotionally sensitive. And I think this probably everyone knows what that means, because we are as well. And um, if you've ever had to deal with a horse in a stressful situation, you know how emotionally sensitive they can be. And we all know about the fly landing on the side and giving the shimmy. So um, that one's pretty obvious. They're nomadic. Horses are historically an extremely nomadic bunch. They cover vast distances, consuming very low value food at a very slow pace. And they do that in large groups. And left to their own devices, for example, some of the horses that are still in Mongolia, cover vast amounts of country. Not because they particularly want to, but because that is how much the food is spread out for them. And therefore, they must cover that territory in order to get what they need. Now, it's interesting enough when you look at the habits of um, animals that live in the wild, they very seldom trot and canter because that is a massive energy depletion. So we're actually putting them in flight mode by doing a lot of trot and canter work, and then we're desensitizing them out of feeling like they're in flight mode. Because the only times that they would run normally in nature is to get away from a predator. So it's a, it just gives us an interesting angle on how some horses get very het up when they trot and canter. They're a prey animal. I think we're all pretty clear on what a prey animal is. So they have, by implication, a massive environmental awareness. Their eyes are not on the front of the head like ours are. They're off towards the side. Their uh, vision is practically 360 degrees with a couple of blind spots front and back. So they know what's going on in their environment because they have to, otherwise they'll die, historically. Okay, not so much now. There's not so many wolves running around in, in Coatesville. But we are dealing with an animal that is still very much programmed with these um, historic shaping mechanisms within their world. They're a herd dweller. If you ever put two horses together, what is the first thing they do? Unless they have argy-bargy, they usually go and groom each other. They're very much part of a group. They don't like living alone. They find it stressful to be on their own. And they actually find it exhausting to be on their own because they're the only one who's responsible for keeping them safe. When they're in a herd, they can kind of share the load a bit. But when they're by themselves, it's me or me or me, and oh hell, I can't relax. So it's really interesting when you watch the behavior of horses that are kept alone a lot versus the behavior of horses that are kept in groups. And it can be quite different. It can be very stressful for them to be on their own all the time. They're extremely skilled, non-verbal communicators. Now, I wouldn't want to say that after too many glasses of wine. They don't talk, obviously. But because of the situations in which they live historically in herds, they can raise their heartbeat and send through an emotion that will ripple through the entire herd in a split second. Because if they don't, the guy at the back is going to end up lunch. So their ability to communicate both putting out, sending communication, and receiving communication non-verbally is massive, absolutely massive. And sometimes we're on our horse and we think, what are they looking at? We don't have a clue. We don't have the same senses that they do because we are not a, as much of a prey animal. We are still a prey animal, but we're not as much as a prey animal as they are. They have a very highly tuned flight response. When we go into our sympathetic nervous system, we have three options, fight, flight, freeze. We actually have four. The last one is fawn, which is, oh, please don't hurt me. Look, I'm really nice, and you really don't want to take my head off. It doesn't work with a wolf, obviously, but it could work with an aggressive stallion if it's within your band. So we, we really tend to talk about fight, fight, flight, and freeze, and horse is definitely predisposed to flight. They, they've got weapons, yes, they've got hooves, they've got teeth, um, but their main get out of jail free card is to run like hell, because that's what, how they keep themselves safe in the wild. And as I said, they've got, they have got weapons, 
but they don't tend to use them. But if pushed, they will. For example, um, you can see a band of wild horses when um, some wolves come down from the high country. They, if they have the opportunity and cannot look after the young foals, they will circle the wolves and they will trample them to death because they know that the, the, the weaker members of the herd have no opportunity to keep themselves safe. So the, um, the stallions or the um, mares will band together and they will kill the predator. So it's an interesting um, thing. They, they're certainly not without defences, but they haven't got armour. They haven't got poison darts. So you know, that's what they ha have to use. And they're an incredible paradox. For something so strong and with such a tuned fear response and pick up on their environment, they're also incredibly gentle and they seek connection with us. Oh, what an amazing animal. There's so much mythology around horses and carrying people from um, the two worlds, the physical world and the spiritual world. and They've been the subject of so much story and legend for millennium. And um, they really are an incredible paradox when you think about it. This is just a quick shot of the horse's nervous system. And we are sitting on a, um, a flight set sympathetic nervous system that actually returns to what we call homeostasis very quickly. So they go, I'm in threat, I'm getting out of there, and now I'm grazing. So they've got a really, really great nervous system for getting them away. They've got great big muscles, and it fills the, um, the major muscles with blood. They do their thing, and then they're back to grazing. So their nervous system actually um, keeps themselves very safe because if they lived in a, a state of high alert, they would completely kill their adrenals, which a lot of people tend to do because they're always watching, always watching. And the horse's nervous system has a very good reset button. They want to be relaxed because they know if they're not, they keep using all this fuel and they're getting all this low quality fuel, lots and lots of grass, and therefore they don't want to burn it off too quickly because they had to work pretty hard to get each mouthful historically in the wild. Now this little um, diagram here is about energetic boundaries. Now I've got a beautiful old thoroughbred that I rescued 10 years ago. And every time I walk towards him, if I walk up too quickly, he goes. Now it's not because I'm gonna hit him. It's because my bow wave of, of energy hits him before my physical body gets to him. And he has very strong personal boundaries. And he finds it overwhelming if I was to walk straight up into his face and catch him, and, and he, can't, he can't stand it to the point that he actually has to physically turn away. Now that's not every horse, that's just him. If you walk straight up to my mare, she'll just go, and what do you want? So it, there is a very much personality-driven element to this, but in general, so I'm gonna talk in general here. At about 15 meters, they have environmental awareness. I can see what's going on about 15 meters around me, and I'm just clocking it. I know it's happening. When you come into the connection zone at about 10 meters, you're like, yep, I can tell that you're looking at me, and I'm just keeping an eye on things, and I can see that you're coming towards me. When you get to five meters, and for some horses it's even before five meters, it's you're in my personal space, respect my space. Some horses it's not, oh, you're in my personal space, lovely to see you, thanks, yeah, let's go play. But it is really interesting when you get to the point of being able to walk up at a horse and go, whoa, I've just stepped through a boundary. Because at 10 meters, 15 meters, they probably, most of them will be fine. Like, yep, yeah, okay, I know where you are. It's all good. If I'm not scared of you, then you know, I'll just let you be you. But at five meters, some horses find that overwhelming, like old Danny does. He just can't stand me rushing through that last five meters, so I have to stop. And I lower my energy. I even take a step back. And then he turns his head and says, oh, hello, it's lovely to see you. Because for him, if I walk straight up to him, that's actually offensive. That is a boundary offense. And he's like, oh, God, you're crude. So rude. And for him, that feels like a threat. So I, yeah, so just going to say that interesting when we think about our horse's energetic boundaries, because um, most of the time we're on our agenda, we are marching up there with our halter, and we've got to catch them because we've got to be um, gone within 45 minutes and we've got to do it quickly. So yeah, just a little think about that. Energetic boundaries can help. Um, that said, I also have a friend who has strong energetic boundaries. It's not just horses. She can't stand when I walk up to her and give her a hug to say hello. More than happy to give a hug when you say goodbye. Can't stand a hug hello. 
I can actually see her leaning back. So now I stop and I leave her three or four metres space and I chat to her from here and I go, how are you going? Now, I've known her for years, but I've realised when I've been doing this work over the last few years, oh my gosh, she's got really strong personal space boundaries and I need to just wait until she invites me in. So play with this with people and with horses as well because it's really interesting when you start going, oh, I can see someone wanting to, to distance themselves or I can see someone wanting to come in. And it's interesting within a horse's world, if you respect their boundaries, they respect you because they think, ah, you're onto it. You're listening to me. You're going to take my point of view into account. Okay, you might be worth connecting with. I'll listen to you then. Yeah. Now we're going to get up and have some fun with boundaries. What I'd like to do is, we've got a couple of spaces. We've got a space at the back and we've got a couple of spaces down the side. And I'd like you to pair up. And it doesn't matter who you pair up, someone you know, someone you don't know, it's, it's all good. But what I want you to do is just be a predator. I want you to put your, your eyes fixed and I want you to walk up, you've got your halter on your arm and I want you to catch that person right now because we've only got 20 minutes for a ride. So if you could just spread out a bit in pairs and take turns. And if we could do it silently, <laughs> if we could do it with no talking. <laughs> so give yourselves a bit of space. Yeah, give yourselves a good five metres, six metres if you can. And if you can just do it without talking, just, re just try it. Because without talking, you can be a lot more aware of your body sense. Humans are great at talking themselves out of being awkward. But if you are quiet, it's very difficult not, it's very difficult if you are not quiet to hear what your body's saying. Because we don't want to be rude. We don't want to look away. We don't want to turn our head. And, and to be honest, I will put serious money on the fact that when someone walks up to you like this, some of you will actually have to drop your gaze. Some of you will have to turn your head away. Some of you will actually find yourself rocking backwards. So just if you can stay really quiet and within your body, just notice. There's no good, there's no bad, there's just noticing. So give yourself a bit of space and have a go. So how did it feel, guys, to be approached by a predator? What is that? Really off-putting, really off yeah. Offensive, yeah. De you felt defensive, yeah. Intimidating, yeah. You felt intimidated, yeah. Worried, yep. Not very nice, is it? And yet in our busy human world, uh, yeah, we do actually march into the paddock quite often on our own agenda. Not really thinking about the horse's agenda. Yeah, I've done it. I still do it when I'm rushing. And then I find old Dan turning his head and going, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. Fair enough. He's the owner of his own boundaries. When you're in a situation like that, the one who is approaching must be sensitive to the one who is approached. The one who is approached sets the boundary. So whoever's coming forward is the one who needs to listen and the one who needs to be sensitive to what they're going through. And um, the one who's approaching is, is fully within their rights to set their boundary. So, yeah. Now we're going to go in somewhere that hopefully we're a lot more familiar with, the, um, the human's world. Now what are we? Yep, we're sentient as well. We are historically nomadic, which might um, seem a little strange. How many of us live in cities? and how many of us live sedentary lives. But to be honest, only the last 6,000 years have been sedentary out of about 1.5 million. So other than that, we have actually been extremely nomadic, uh, wandering around. And we could go back to biblical times, the Cain and Abel story and, and so forth. But um, yeah, we are actually really recent sedentary um, race. We are physically and emotionally sensitive. We are both a prey and a predator. So we're, we're quite a predator shape. Our eyes are on the front. The front of our body is wider than the sides. And um, we are able to fix a gaze on a single point. <laughs> I knew that was going to get a laugh, that one. 
yeah, that was a bit of a cheap shot, that one. Um, so yeah, we are, we are also a prey. How can we defend ourselves? Have we got scales? Have we got, you know, poison down our back? Have we got wings to fly away? No, we haven't. We're actually really, really exposed. And quite often we think of ourselves as the ultimate predator. <laughs> yeah. Put us in um, the Norongoro crater with a whole lot of lions and we'll find out we ain't an ultimate predator at all. We are because of our intelligence to make tools and make defense systems, but inherently within our own bodies, eh -eh. We are historically tribe dwellers, and the lifestyles we're leading now are very separate. You know, I live with one other adult and two small people, and I also have you know, adults that I touch lives with, but, but really, in essence, I live with one other person on an ongoing basis. And I don't get out in the morning and find that the shaman sitting over there or the guy who makes the music and there's someone weaving baskets, we are not living like that anymore. And yet that is, again, a really, really recent development. And that has an implication on our communication. Because we are verbal and non-verbal as well, hugely. You found, even when you weren't talking over there, when you approached each other, you definitely felt some communication going on when you weren't using your words. And historically, we have had a lot stronger non-verbal communication abilities than we do now. And according to whoever um, measures these things, I have no idea how they measure these things anyway, but 10% of what we say is the words that we use is our communication. And then something like 30% is our um, tone of voice and the other 50-something percent is our body language. And how do they measure that? I have no idea. But anyway, we are very strong non-verbal communicators, and yet we prioritize verbal communication hugely. And we also use um, non-verbal communication blocks like email and text messaging and so forth, where you can't see the person, you can't hear the tone of their voice, you have no idea what their body is saying to you. And that's why a lot of miscommunication happens with modern communication techniques, because we're wanting to know the bigger picture, but we don't have all the non-verbal stuff to go with it. We have access to fight, flight, or freeze, and quite often this is a personality thing. I'm a fighter, my husband's a freezer. It doesn't sound very nice, does it? But that's, that is our inbuilt response from as we were children, that's what we developed to do. And um, so many things build in your inbuilt sympathetic nervous system response. And we can move between all of them. Sometimes each one of them is more appropriate than the other. But again, this is what happens when we go into our nervous system and we um, react rather than respond. And yes, we have weapons, but they're tools. They're not weapons within us. Our teeth, really, come on. Fingernails, yeah, they're not going to do much either. Yes, we could kick someone, but they're probably going to survive that, depending on where we kick, I guess. Isn't he gorgeous? <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a really gross representation of how we take in information from our world. We have great big hands. I oh, know, it's a bit foul, isn't it? <laughs> we have a lot of nerves in our lips and our tongue. We have relatively big ears and big eyes. And we have lots of sensory awareness with our hands. This is how we experience the world. And um, it's just not pretty. But as you can see, <laughs> which bits are on our horse? <laughs> our butt. How much sensory awareness do we have up through our legs and our pelvis? Bugger all. So yeah, riding horses when we're a, one of these is um, quite a challenging situation. And here's our fight or flight system. And I'm sure we all know what it is like to get an adrenaline rush. Our breathing starts, gets rapid and our blood pressure comes up and our brain stops working properly. We shake. Um, we're ready to run. Basically, we are programmed to do a fight or flight response. Freeze doesn't tend to go down that well. Our body is ready to fight or flight. And we um, draw our blood away from our higher brain function and we put it into our big muscles so we can be ready for physical action, be that getting the hell out of there or um, having a scrap. And a lot of things happen when we go into our fight or flight response. And the reason I'm laboring the point about our sympathetic nervous system is because this is a position 
this is a situation that we've identified from the words that we used of how we feel when we're riding. We spend a lot of time in this. And that has a massive impact on our horses. So we are actually cruising down the adrenaline highway quite a lot of times when we're with our horses. And that really does have a massive impact on their ability to relax, their ability to stay calm, and their ability to concentrate and learn. They're a massive nonverbal communicator. And we're sitting on them in a state of mild to sometimes extreme panic. They're probably going to know what's going on with us. Um, there's some really interesting stuff that's come out in the last few years is a group called the Heart Math Foundation, and they can measure the electromagnetic energy coming from your heart. And they say that the electromagnetic energy coming from your heart is some astronomical amount higher than the electromagnetic energy coming from your brain. And we really, um, when we say you know, make decisions with your heart and with your gut, this is actually the science to prove that there is a massive impact on your ability to make decisions when you are working with your entire body as opposed to just working with your brain. As you can see at the top, that frustration, it's very jagged. Can you imagine standing beside somebody who's feeling like that and they're all like, Ugh. it's a very abrasive kind of energy. And the appreciation energy is a very wave-like energy. And waves tend to communicate what we call congruence. And congruence is you feel a certain way and you act a certain way and they're very similar to each other. You know, a lot of humans are very incongruent. Yes, it's so lovely to see you. Oh, great, marvelous. When actually in the back of your head you're thinking, I can't wait to get out of this conversation. This is making me really uncomfortable. So we're saying and, and acting, we're faking it. And really inside of us, there's a very different picture going on. Um, and horses are very congruent. They're scared, you know. They're happy, you know. They don't really have the ability to fake it like we do. The other thing we tend to do as human beings is we have these really busy heads. I can't, I, I, and I need to pick up the groceries, and I've got, not got enough um, cat food, and oh my God, what did she say to me? I can't remember. What was that thing I was supposed to do? And yeah, last week, oh man, that was so embarrassing. And then next week, I've got to do this, and then I've got, oh my God, I forgot to buy more light bulbs. We've got... 24-7 thoughts churning through our head. And it's very destabilizing for a non-verbal communicator to feel the busyness rattling around in our head. And um, it's constant. It is constant. That doesn't mean we can't do anything about it. But let's just be honest, guys. Who has a really calm head most of the time? Good. Good on you, Kim. Awesome. We also have a split in our ability to process things. We have a conscious mind, which feeds stuff up into our thoughts, and we have a subconscious mind, which runs a lot of our body processes, but also stores a lot of our belief systems. Our expectations of what life is gonna be like are pretty much set up by the time we're six years old. Okay, who am I? Um, what's my relationship to myself? What's my relationship to others? And what's my relationship to the universe at large? And sometimes, those belief systems have never been updated. So we're kind of working with really, really old software. And even though we may grow up, the same things keep tripping us up. We repeat patterns of behavior that don't serve us. Why is that? Why can't we change our habits more easily? Our subconscious programming is really compelling, really, really strong. And even though we know it's not good for us to eat mountains of chocolate, Jody, I know, we do. Um, we, we do. We continue to do that. So there's some really strong motivators in there that we're not actually consciously aware of. So I just want you to know that. So now we're going to go on to the connection side of it. Just turn my little paper over here. Now we've touched on a few of these things. You can run, but you can't hide. The equine system is like a huge receiving and amplifier. A receiver and amplifier for emotional vibrations. No matter how good you are at hiding things from yourself and others, your nervous system still involuntarily broadcasts what you're really feeling at a frequency horses are especially good at tuning into. Oh, yay. No, it is yay, actually, because the honesty that they can show us and the things they can reflect back to us are so incredibly helpful at us realizing what we do that doesn't serve us. They give us brilliant feedback, but boy, they are there. They are watching, always watching, or should I should say always feeling, always feeling what's going on in your world. 
So one thing that horses can't stand is incongruence. If you're sad, be okay with being sad. Because if you're sad and pretending to be happy, the horse is going, yeah, nah, this, nah, something's off here. Because if you're in the herd, and we're basically we're asking to go into a leadership position and make decisions for the combined system of horse and rider. If you're in a herd, they're going, I don't want to be led by you because something feels off. You feel really incoherent and you feel really incongruent and now nah, this is just not right. So the, they don't mind you being sad. No problem whatsoever. They're not judging you. They're not like humans. They don't sit there and go, oh God, she's always so unhappy and oh, I don't want a rider like this and I'm not a happy rider. And mm. They're not doing that at all. What they want to do is they want you to be honest. And if you are sad, be sad. And that's okay. But don't try and pretend you're happy because the horse just feels that you are all over the show like a mad thing and it can't get a fix, and it can't trust you. Because if the wolf comes down the hill and you're sitting there being sad, pretending to be happy, you're kind of distracted state, you might not see him, and you might not keep him safe. And you might not make the appropriate reaction to keep the whole herd safe. So in a mini herd of two, you're actually really important to them. Because you've invited them into the human world, and tell you what, the human world is damn crazy when you look at it from a horse's point of view. We take the skins of another animal, you throw them over their back, we jump into a predator position, then we ask them to do dressage. So it's actually a really, really weird world. But they do it. They offer to be with us as well. And, and it's amazing. But from their point of view, some of the things we do, stick them in a tin can and hurtle down the road at 100 k's. Seem really odd. But hey, they do it. So yeah, we're talking about the need for stable leadership. And... Um, that's all they really want, just is honesty. Now, this is our, um, our representation of your electromagnetic fields within your heart. See, the horse's electromagnetic field within its heart, and this has been measured, is about 80 to 100 feet, so that's how it would look on a rugby field. And ours is about 8 to 10 feet, so they've got a massive electromagnetic field. They need to, being a, a prey animal, they need to pick up a hell of a lot around their environment. But it also means that we need to be aware that they've actually clocked us before we've come out of the stable. They know what's going on. We're walking down the paddock and, and we can just see them and they're actually already picking up on what our heart rhythm is. Ah, yes, okay, who's coming to ride me today? Oh, you're feeling fabulous or mm, something going on there. They will know that from a very, very great distance. So the other thing is you have a unique personal vibration and it does vary. Your mood varies your vibration, but it is unique, and your horse will know what that is. So does your dog. For example, you know, our little Jack Russell will lie under a rug, and I'll go to put my hand on her, she doesn't growl. My son goes to put his hand on her, he hasn't even touched her. And she'll be like, get your hand off there, last time you touched me, you poked me with a stick. And she will know, and she can't see us. She knows our electromagnetic vibration completely blind. She's just reading it in the energy field. So they're quite fabulous. And horses are very good at this as well. They also, because of their electromagnetic field being so large and being so strong, they affect ours. Now, everybody knows that when you're around your horse and you're feeling a bit off, there's no greater place than to bury your head in their mane and have a bloody good cry. Now, maybe that's just me, but um, I find being around horses extremely comforting. And they don't judge, they don't talk. Sometimes it's just lovely to be in their energy, even if you're not riding them, to just be around them. Now, I've got a friend who's um, got a horse that's extremely grumpy. He is just like, get out of my space, don't talk to me. He's just one of those. And she had a very difficult situation where two of their, she's, um, she manages a, a pack of hounds for one of the hunts. And two of the hounds got killed on the road. She came up the driveway in floods of tears, absolutely just floored by this awful situation. This horse came up, stuck his head over the fence, and offered it. Now, normally he would just take your head off. He would bite you, he'd just grump at you. But he said, ah, you need me, and I'm here, and I can come for you, and I'm coming into your space. And he did, he offered himself. Ooh, spooky, eh? They really are very, very, very giving and beautiful animals. The other thing I'd like to talk about is boundarying your space as well. Now, as women, and I'm going to make a generalisation, so sorry guys in the room, um, we have a, great, a greater deal, a greater challenge with boundaries than a lot of men do. Especially if there's been any abuse in your background, boundaries can be a very, very difficult area. 
And horses can show you boundary challenges you may have outside of the horse realm. So for example, when somebody is dealing with horses and they tend to get walked all over, it's a pretty strong chance that in other areas of their life, their boundaries are being dismissed as well. So the horses are gently trying to show us, guys, you gotta look after yourself. I'm not supposed to be in your space, but I'm gonna show you that I can come into your space because you got no personal boundaries whatsoever. And all I'm saying is not, this is not an attack on anyone who gets walked over, it's just saying is that they are showing us things that have implications beyond the horse world. And we'd be in a good position to listen because they're pretty cheap in terms of therapy. Now this picture here, I'm sorry for the quality of it, but I do respect the copyright on this particular photo. Um, I don't know if any of you do any meditation or know anything about chakras and energy centers. I certainly know Fiona has a lot of experience in this area and it has a big effect on the acupuncture work that she does and working with the energy centers within the body. So as we can see the horse chakra, we've got a pretty yellow one sitting underneath the saddle area there. And then we go and plonk a human on top. Oh, pity he's got no legs, but oh well, you get the idea. So we sit on the horse's solar plexus chakra, and this governs their sense of self and personal power. Okay? And we are sitting on our base chakra, which governs our self-preservation and personal survival. Hmm. Interesting combination, sense of power and personal survival and preservation. Stick all those into a big mixing pot and we're riding a flight animal. Is there any wonder why fear is a fairly prevalent feeling around horses? Because they are really tapping into our whole ability to feel safe in this world. And they are, we are sitting on one of their power centers. So yeah, if you feel stressed or if you feel fearful when you're riding, it's no great surprise. You're not alone. Now we're going to move on to a few of the tools for mastering the mind game of writing. And there is, before we move on to that, there's a couple of other things I'd like to fill in in the workbook. Because we've been through the human world, and we're now, um, before we move into the tools, we're just going to say, around horses on page two, got some words down the left hand side there. Fearful, frustrated, guilty, aggressive, confident and grateful. If you could just tick the boxes there. And again, you don't have to share this at all. This is um, for your own awareness. I'm not going to tell you what's good to feel or what's bad to feel. The only place to create change is at first with creating awareness. And when you've done that one, if you could move into this, each line there represents a continuum. I am a tense, relaxed type of person. High energy, low energy, introvert, extrovert. Emotionally even or emotionally expressive. And the two letters underneath is what you identified before, Christina, in familiar surroundings and in unfamiliar surroundings because we can morph into quite different people when we're in unfamiliar surroundings and feel pressured. So if you've got your little, oh, that just not gonna sound so good, FU's done, <laughs> you can then turn over, and now that we've got a bit of an awareness of ourselves, let's just focus our awareness on the types of horses that we're riding. So it tends to be a good idea to pick one, the one that you spend the most time with if you've got multiple horses. And on the following page there is, my horse is a tense, relaxed, high energy, low energy, reactive, non-reactive, compliant, non-compliant type of horse. And again, in familiar surroundings and in unfamiliar surroundings. Okay, if everybody's done that, just um, have a wee look at both of the charts. 
And you can do this in your own time. We don't have to do it here because I'm mindful that it's getting um, towards 9 o'clock. Have a look at the charts and see how much you mirror your horse or your horse mirrors you. Are you completely different types or are you actually converging to be pretty much the same? So that's all, that's all I'm going to say about that. It's completely up to you to come to whatever conclusions you feel are appropriate. The next page on your workbook gives you an opportunity to write some notes about some of the things I'm going to talk about next. And you also have a clear space on the other side if you want to take any more notes. Okay, let's start with in your bubble. This is my bubble. My happy bubble with my beautiful mare. So when we ride around in our bubble, all our focus is on what's happening inside our bubble. But we've got lots of things trying to prick our bubble. We've got our brain going 90 to the dozen. We've got people sitting on the side of a truck talking and looking at us and making statements about us, and we're imagining what they're saying. We've got other horses often, and we've got an instructor talking to us, pulling us out of our bubble and telling us to do things. So what I'm inviting you to do, guys, is when you're riding, really pull in the sides of your bubble and think about what is the most important thing that I need to focus on right now. It's probably not the guy sitting on the truck. It's probably not the other horses working in the other arena. Yes, it is your instructor because you're paying them if they're there. And also, I'd like to invite you to think that if your mind is so busy processing and going over things, then you need to start looking at some tools to find some peace within that because, to be honest, your head can't tell you how to ride well. There's too much information travelling between you and your horse for your head to process and tell you what to do. So you end up riding by your sensory information, your feel sense. You end up reacting and riding with your subconscious, not your conscious mind, because your conscious mind cannot deal with the volume of information that's coming back and forth from your environment when you're sitting on a horse. And be aware of what's trying to pop your bubble. Because it's different things to different people. For example, one of the major things that I have popping my bubble when I have people sitting on the side of the arena, and when I organize these riding courses, I would make sure I rode at 7 o'clock in the morning because then I would know no one would be looking. It's great, because I didn't have to imagine what they were saying. Yes. I'm standing up here admitting that I was paranoid and that I felt judged and I found it really, really hard to ride in front of other people. Just a little question. When you go out and compete and the problems that you have, could they be bubble-popping problems? Could it be that you can find your bubble when you're at home but when you're out competing, your bubble is just blown to bits? Because your horse will know and it will feel abandoned and it will feel fearful. So yeah, just, just think about your bubble. Pop your bubble on. The other thing I would say is that when we're riding, we tend to want our horses to be calm and to be focused. Mm, are we? Because if we're blaming them for stuff, that we can't even provide in the relationship and they're not providing it, that, that's pretty crap, actually. Oh, you be really nice and calm, but I'll be this panicking little thing sitting on top of you. So, guys, all I'm saying is just have a think about it. Think about the relationship and what you bring to it and also what you can change. This old chestnut, breathing. Oh, breathing's great. If we didn't do it, we'd die. But breathing informs an incredible amount about our body. It informs our safety response. When we looked at the fight or flight picture, we saw that our breathing becomes very high. Very <laughs> and when we're breathing deeply, and we're breathing down into our abdominal cavity, 
that informs our whole body to go, oh, I'm safe. Because if you're not safe, you can't actually breathe deeply. But we can trick it because we have such great mind-body connection that even when we're feeling really uptight, if we take a couple of minutes to do some really beautiful, calm breathing practice, we reset our nervous system. It's one of the fastest ways to reset our nervous system. So next time you're feeling really, oh, just come back to breathing. When I started with the biomechanics work, um, I made up these, and I'm such a geek, I made up these little signs and I posted them around where I rode at home and they were things that I had to think about. The only one that's left now is breathing. And yes, I've straightened up my asymmetry in my hip, and yes, I've opened up my chest when I'm riding, and yes, I've got lots of physical change. The only one that I have to continually remember is my fabulous get out of jail free card is to breathe deeply and breathe calmly and breathe rhythm rhythmically because what it communicates to the horse is massive. If you can do nothing else, please. Remember this one. The other thing I'd invite you to do is um, a fun game called reciprocal breathing. When you're going along on your horse and you're all cruising about and it's all quite relaxed and fun, do a big, big sigh and just see what happens with your horse. Because quite often they're mirroring. They're mirroring your breathing. So if you're a shallow chest breather, they're a shallow chest breather, and you're sort of getting into this wound up spiral. If you're able to give a big sigh and often a yawn, the horse will go, oh yeah, that feels good. She's cruising, I'm cruising, and everything's right with the world. So sighing can actually be a huge help. The other thing you can do is smile. Smiling, smiling is awesome because we have an inbuilt response to, of relaxation when we smile. It's actually physically impossible to feel really pissed off when we smile. And it's physically impossible to feel really scared. And I mean smile, smile, not like uh, grimace smile. So yeah, try that as well, because it is a great jaw relaxer. And a lot of us hold a hell of a lot of tension in our jaws. And we're sitting there going, yes, I'm happy, and my teeth are grinding together and all hell. We're really, we use our jaws for a lot of holding. You're going to like the next one. <laughs> Strike a pose. Because, again, this mind-body connection is so strong, we can inform our body that we are powerful, that we are safe, and that everything is good, and we are in charge of the world. So, you know, Wonder Woman is in what we call a power pose. It's an infeasible body that that woman's got, but anyway... And the other thing I'd invite you to do is think about how your poses affect your horse because some of us are great big personalities and we're power posing our way through life. Some of us are not. Some of us are shoulders may be coming forward, our head may be coming down, our chin is dropping. Our poses are very different. Now, using our poses to inform our energy and to inform how we're going to connect with a horse is really important. So if I'm coming at Dan, if I come at him as Wonder Woman, he's, he can't stand it. He's down the other end of the paddock. So I pause and I think, what pose do I need to inform the energy that this horse is going to need to connect with me? So I think, I need to do a more feminine pose. Now, that doesn't mean submissive. A lot of people kind of link masculine aggression, feminine submissive. Eh -eh. No. Masculine is a projecting pose you're taking your energy out into the world. Feminine is more of a receptive pose. I'm making space for someone else's energy to come towards me. That doesn't mean I'm sitting there going, oh, hello, thank you, oh, it's really nice here, yeah, please, can I catch you? No, it's not that at all. It's, I'm here, I'm not gonna send my energy out at you and offend you. I'm holding my boundaries, I'm always holding my boundaries because I need to keep myself safe but I'm allowing you to come towards me and I'm being more gentle. Now, if the horse is going to run over the top of you, you do the Wonder Woman pose, girl. You work it. And you put your chest out there and you put your chin up. And I'm sure everyone's got a fair idea what a power pose is. They actually, in some of the training, I've seen videos of people doing power poses before they go into interviews. And you, you know, you're going for an interview, absolutely packing it. They get them to do these power poses for a couple of minutes before they go in there and consistently they perform better in the interview. Because of our mind-body connection, we tell our body we are powerful, we are strong, we are in control. 
And even though our head might be going, no, we're not, by standing in a pose, we actually feel that way, and our head starts telling us we feel that way as well. The other thing is our eyes, being predator eyes and stuck on the front. A really good way, if you have a horse that's very shy, is to just soften your eyes. Instead of going from laser focus, go into to, um, soft focus. Because our eyes actually hold a hell of a lot of energy. If I look at you and I really stare at you, I bet you feel really uncomfortable right now because I am not shifting my gaze off you. And yet if I soften my eyes and I occasionally look up, it's a very, very different interaction. And they say you bore holes with your eyes. It's very true. Energetically, we do bore holes in people. We also give them the up and down and we do all this stuff. But just don't forget the role of your eyes because they have a massive impact on your horse because when you're fixed on, you're going to kill them as far as they're concerned anyway. That's what they feel very affronted by, because that's what a predator will do to them. The other thing is the mirroring effect again. How do we want our horses to go? Well, let's just take dressage for an example, because I, can, you know, I can't jump very well. If I want my horse to be poised, and I want it to be moving freely, and I want it to have a certain magnificence about it, then I have to do that myself. I have to be in self-carriage, and I have to be thinking forward. Because the mirroring effect between human and animal is so strong that it's like sending someone out to war and going, here, you go and fight, but I'll stand back here, and I'm not going to lead you. I'm just going to tell you to go and do it um, from back here in a safe space. So guys, if you want your horse to go a certain way, think about the pose that you would need to be in for you to go a certain way like that. Because we're not really going to get a magnificent horse when we're going around with our chin down and you know, we're doubting ourselves and why won't he give me extended trot? We're, we're not extending at all. So we need to keep take on the poses that we're looking to, um, to get them to emulate. And this is just the sympathetic nervous system versus the parasympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic is rest, digest, um, restore, learn. We have lots of our higher brain function. And on the other side of it, we have our sympathetic nervous system, where we fight, flight, freeze. So we have a certain drop-off in performance when we start panicking. No great deal there. But everyone's curve is different. Some people have very high ability to withstand arousal. And others have very, very low ability. They go into the panic zone and they go into overwhelm very quickly. All I'm inviting you to do is get to know yours a bit. And notice, oh yeah, I'm unraveling. Okay, what do I need to do to get safe, to get back into a place where I can perform at my peak? The next one is coming to your senses. I'm sure a lot of you have heard the phrase mindfulness and presence, and it's gone beyond spirituality. It's something that's fairly common amongst um, general speech now. And one of the best ways to get present is to get with your senses. Because when we're not present, we have a future focus or we have a past focus, and that lives in our head. So we're rehashing conversations or we're worrying or even being excited and anticipating. That again is a future focus. And a lovely little phrase is, no amount of guilt will change the past and no amount of worry will change the future. All you've got is right now. And if you want to read anything more about that, Eckhart Tolle is a great author talking about the power of now. Because the only place you can take action is right now, right here, in this moment. And a lot of times in our heads, we are racing forward, we're wandering back, we're racing forward, we're wandering back, and we don't stay right here, right now. And our horse deserves us. They live in a very present world, and they need us to be present as well to get the best out of them. And it can be a really good thing to practice. So you find your head unraveling, go, right, what can I smell? What can I hear? What can I taste? And just get back into your senses. It can be a really good recheck, a reset of um, everything within your body. Those voices. What can we do with those voices? Well, we have four really good options. And this is actually um, from a series called um, Mind Power, and it allows us to take control of our thoughts. We own our thoughts. A lot of us think our thoughts come from somewhere, but we're not quite sure where, but we actually own them, and we've never been trained to take control of them. 
So if you're having a thought that is disempowering, such as, I'll never learn how to do sitting trot, it's really hard, I can't do it, it's just impossible. You go, ah, speak to the hand, not interested. That doesn't help me do sitting trot, so just shut the up. The other thing is you can observe it and go, ah, <laughs> I'm having a negative thought. There you go then. The other thing is exaggerate to ridiculous, you're right. You could ride for a thousand years and you'll never master sitting trot. In fact, you are the worst sitting trotter in the whole world. I've never seen anyone do sitting trot so bad as you. And until your subconscious mind goes, oh, don't be so rude, I'm, that's, I'm not that bad. And you actually start defending the thought that you were having before. The other one is to insert the exact opposite, switch it on its head. No, I'm great at sitting trot. I am, and I can do it, and I'm going to do it. So again, these are just some techniques to go to the voice, ah, that's enough, you're not helping me. Because we actually, in a way, indulge our internal voice, and ah, there's arguments going on there, and we become fascinated listening to our internal dialogues. If they're not helping us, don't go there. Don't let it run your life, because it's your voice. And unfortunately, you're in your head, and you have to listen to it 24-7. Yada, 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 yada. The other thing is, don't just control your thoughts, control your spoken word as well. Because we have to listen to our spoken word. The people that we meet only get to listen to us for a few minutes, and you know, obviously you guys are listening to me for a few more minutes. But every time you speak, you hear yourself. So, oh, I'm a rubbish rider. My horse hates me. Oh, it's terrible. I can't jump. I'm scared. I'm this. I don't, I'm not saying that to be cruel. I'm just saying that you are reinforcing a perception. You are reinforcing a belief with every thought and every word that you speak. Just make them good ones. It's not about being arrogant, oh, I'm, I'm damn hot and sexy. No, it's actually about looking after yourself and changing the toxicity of your thought and word diet because some people are really toxic to themselves. The next one is living outside in is actually inside out. A lot of times we are playing to the crowd, we're perfecting, we're performing, we're pleasing, we're hoping to get positive feedback from somebody. Or we're, you know, one that really struck a chord with me is a, a statement that Dr. Libby uses, is eternally chasing the ghost of parental approval. Now I realized when I grew up and started writing again, I was still chasing my father's approval. I wanted him to think of me as a good writer. Now, how sad is that? I was in my mid-30s. For God's sake, get over yourself. But until I started thinking about it, I didn't realize that I was looking for a pat on the head. I wasn't living my life. I was living a life that was going to get feedback that was going to be positive. So the other thing I would invite you to do is just think about your audience. Are you riding with your thoughts and feelings in mind, your thoughts and feelings in mind, or are you riding with other people's thoughts and feelings in mind? Because if you're writing in from the outside in, it's not your world. They've got their own agendas, they've got their own challenges, they've got their own points of view, and they have nothing to do with you. And to be honest, what they think of you is none of your business. It's got nothing to do, it's got more to do with who they are than it does to do with who you are. So just, you know, don't go there. It's kind of, and this is not a nice statement, but I've, I've had it said to me, is it's when are you gonna wean yourself? When are you going to become an adult? Because if you're going around trying to please everyone, you're not really living an adult life. You're going around, you know, still being a kid. So, um, yeah, that really slapped me upside the head because it was true. And um, it doesn't serve us. It really doesn't serve us. And sure as hell doesn't serve our horses. One thing that I do is um, I do a third-party check. When I hear myself thinking a thought of, oh, look at her, what does she think? Oh, da-da-da-da, I bet she, da-da-da. This is not my voice. I know that this is me imagining what someone else might be saying about me. It's a waste of time. I don't know. I'm not drilling into their brain and getting a broadcast of what they're saying. They might not be thinking that at all. They might be going, God, I really like that girl's boots. I don't know. That's the, that's the truth. We simply do not know, so let's not waste any time wondering. And if they are saying something mean, well, hell, I don't want to hear it. That's their problem.
And this is what living from the outside in is like. Living from the inside out, sorry, because that's the right way around, is what are you looking for? How does it feel for you? Your world, your horse, not playing to the crowd. And that's a very different place because you can please yourself because you have the feedback to be able to do that because you've got your feel, feel sense. But you don't have the feedback of everyone else's brain and it's not your life. No, it's their life and their perception. So live your life. The other point I would like to make is that a little thanks goes a long way. We know we're nonverbal. We've talked about nonverbal communication. We've talked um, about the appreciation curve being very, very smooth and rhythmical and the frustration curve being very jagged. How often do you thank your horse? Because the rocket fuel for a horse is joy and gratitude. They don't want to live under a taskmaster who is always criticizing everything they do. And you remember when you were at school, what are the teachers that you really remember fondly and the ones that you worked hardest for? They were the ones that were actually nice, the ones that encouraged you, that saw the beauty in you. Not the ones that sat there going, oh, wow, well, you'll never make anything of your life, will you? You can't even do this. They're not going to inspire you. You are in a relationship with a very, very sensitive animal. Don't pause to say thanks. Because, hell, they don't have to. They can choose at any moment to dump you and bugger off, but they don't. They're so much bigger and so much stronger than we are. So say thanks, guys, because I can remember watching a lesson at Manolo's last year, and Fiona, you were with me. This mare was trying her butt off. Everything she was being asked to do, she'd just do whatever she could. And when she stopped her lesson, she just stood there with her ears out, and Manolo came up and patted her. And she just see her go, what a relief. Did the rider pat her? No. No, the rider was too worried about looking bad in front of the spectators. And Manolo was thanking this mare for all of her efforts. And I tell you what, it was bloody tragic. She was trying so hard to do what she was being asked. And yet if it wasn't perfect, that rider probably thought she had high standards. But actually she was crushing the soul of that mare. She was doing her best. So, in summary, ride with feel. Ride with focus. Stay in your bubble. Your horse and you are the most important people on the ground at that moment in time. Not everyone else. Just really honour the horse by staying present. Don't disappear out of the arena or out of the forest or wherever you are. Stay focused on them and you and what's going on in your feel sense. Emotional agility. Here we can really learn from the horse. Get mad, listen to it, learn from it, get over it. Not still be sulking a week later. We can really hold on to our moods like nothing else. We always, sometimes we wear them as badges of honour. But a horse is very emotionally agile. I'm scared. I've resolved the situation. I'm grazing. I'm good. So try and take a leaf out of their book and treat your emotions as information. There's a really good um, chart from a lady called Linda Koinov called Emotions, and she is um, a very good horse author, horse book author. She says, use your emotions as information messaging. And so if you feel a certain emotion, it's not, it's not good, it's not bad. You know, being scared is not bad. It's just asking you to recognize that your safety needs attention. Use it, act accordingly, move on. So emotional agility really gives our horses space for us and um, not to grump around on their back. Come back to balance. Come back to emotional balance as quickly as you can. Energetic awareness. We've talked about boundaries and we've talked about energy fields. Now, you can feel things before you can, your head can make a story about them. So when we're very aware and very focused on our bodies, we know that the horse is going to throw its head up before it does. And before our head can go, the horse is going to throw its head up. Our brain and, and our word, our internal thought is much slower than our feel sense. So we know that that back muscle started to change. 
we know that that head started to tilt and we can feel that within our own body and our own sensing mechanism, but we can only feel that if we're really in our own bodies. We're present and we're listening with our whole body. And that brings us on to the last one, is listen with your whole body. And listen with love, don't listen to criticize. Because boy, it's a hard road being a horse with somebody sitting up there giving them a hard time all the time when they're doing their best. Our body is our ultimate feedback mechanism. Our head can't tell us how to write, our body's gonna tell us how to write. Now this little one here is, um, it goes a bit deeper than just the horse rider connection because I've learned so much about myself beyond being a rider from horses when I actually started tuning in and listening to what my beautiful Dewey was telling me. And um, it is brave to ask, it's uncomfortable. Some of the things you hear about yourself, they suck. But unless you become aware of them, you can't do anything about them. You know, the old psycho um, cycle of awareness, acceptance, and action is true. If you don't know about it, you can't do anything about it. So yeah, if the horse is showing that you've got no boundaries, you might as well listen. Because they're not doing it to be bloody-minded. They're doing it to try and help you grow and help you have a nicer life. I don't know if, I know some of you do um, read and listen to Klaus's work, but um, a horse will only bond voluntarily and devotedly with a truly adult human being who is conscious and internally controlled, authentic and fully responsible for all his or her actions. Whew, that's quite heavy, isn't it? Something to aim for, though. Yeah, this kind of losing our rag and whacking them with a the crop, yeah. Yeah, the horse probably doesn't enjoy that, does it? And we probably feel guilty afterwards as well. So, in closing, I'd like to say thanks very much, and I wish you all really, really joyful riding. <laughs>